got everyone in, so whenever you want to start. Great. Wow, the turnout is awesome today. I am just impressed at all of you overachievers who are coming to our off-week conversation um, and engaging with us um, on this very important deep dive topic. Um, I am extremely excited today to uh, be able to turn over the floor to colleagues of ours at the Coalition on Adult Basic Education. Um, they have agreed to bring you some of this information that ties to the conversations we've been having over the last couple of weeks around uh, the who is the dislocated worker, around issues of equity, around workforce connections, understanding how best to serve uh, those folks who are being impacted uh, by the COVID pandemic. So um, we know that we cannot continue with this conversation without acknowledging the fact that many of the folks uh, that we need to serve in state um, are folks who will be coming through the pipeline of adult basic education. And um, I truly, having coming, come from work in the state, um, continue to value um, the contribution of folks in the adult basic ed space and the important work that they do day to day with uh, many times not enough funding, not enough support, and uh, sometimes not any clear connections to some of these other efforts that are going on within the state around reskilling um, or around career pathways. So, so excited to be able to make this clear connection to the adult basic ed space um, today. And so I am very excited to turn over the floor um, to Chief Executive Officer of COABE, Sharon Bonney. She's been an amazing collaborative partner. She's brought on a couple of folks who are going to help her present this information and talk about some state examples. So um, Sharon, the floor is all yours. Amanda, thank you so much. It's really such a pleasure to be here with you today. And the title of our presentation is Adult Education and Economic Catalyst. And our goal really is through this presentation to share how adult education will be the economic catalyst. So I have with me here today, Lori Kirsten Joseph. She's Vice President at Pima Community College, an award-winning administrator there, who also serves on our Board of Directors, and Patricia Tyler, the Executive <laughs> Director for the National Association of the State Directors of Adult Education. So Pat and Lori, thank you for being willing to share with me today. We have a lot of really exciting information to share with you. So I'm just gonna kick it off real quick. Um, our mission at COABE, the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, is to inspire educators so adults succeed and communities thrive. I'm just going to very quickly run through a few things that we do. We provide leadership, professional development, advocacy, and communication. We represent the field of 65,000 educators that work in 2,000 plus programs, serving 1.5 million adult learners across the country. We held a national conference for, that had more than 3,200 adult educators and administrators that attended and had over 1.3 million page views, meaning that people were, those were unique visits to different presentations and our exhibit hall and that sort of thing. So a lot of interest from the field. And what's exciting is they're still going back. That conference took place in July. They're still going back and checking out the archives. We hold 50 plus webinars annually. In the last few months because of COVID, of those 50,000, we've served more than 32,000 practitioners. So huge you know, uh, uptick there because of COVID. We also release a peer-reviewed thematic journal of research and viewpoint essays. Right now, the current journal focuses on workforce literacy. The next journal is going to focus on racial equity and immigrant integration. Um, we hold or we send out 350 plus annual communications to our members. We've held over 500 face-to-face -face visits with legislators at the, the congressional level. Um, we've had over 145,000 legislative connections from our field. We award over $40,000 annually to our members for, um, to recognize excellence. And we're involved in some major initiatives to reskill adults and provide jobs through um, Google Applied Digital Skills Initiative, which seeks to um, give skilling to 50,000 plus adult learners. Through the IBM Skills Build Initiative, which we will be rolling out during our Adult Ed and Family Literacy Week, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, as well as our Amazon Career Choice Initiative, where we serve as that direct pipeline from our local programs into Amazon. And one thing I just want to say real quickly here is that with Amazon, um, we weren't sure what kind of uptick we'd get. Once we went right to the local program administrators, there was such excitement and enthusiasm that Amazon had to go out and hire additional staff to keep up with it. 
So there's a lot of interest from our local programs to help their adult learners get jobs. They will be holding a virtual learning fair for our adult learners on the last day of our um, National Adult Ed and Families Literacy Week. And we're, we're just very excited about this partnership that we've had in place uh, since last October when we met them at the US Chamber of Commerce Talent Forward Conference. We also have an award-winning um, project called Educate and Elevate. And I see it's going to the video, which I'm not gonna share, but this is through a Success Files with Rob Lowe. This went out to 143 million viewers across the nation. And it really was about um, uplifting the student success stories and uplifting the Educate and Elevate public awareness campaign that we have. So what I'd like to say briefly about this is that this campaign uplifts stories like Story Musgrave, the astronaut who had, he was, had dropped out of school, got his GED, went on to get two doctorates to fly five solo missions to the moon and back, owns multiple companies now, as well as Dr. Richard Carmona, who is the only um, unanimously confirmed U.S. Surgeon General, the 17th U.S. Surgeon General of the country, who also had a similar story, had dropped out of school, needed to get his GED to even go into the military, wanted to go into the special forces, and was told, you're going to need to get your GED. Got that and, and moved on and moved forward in his career, became a, a police officer, a doctor, and then, you know, culminating with being the U.S. Surgeon General. But there's much more traditional stories, um, like Nita Anasari, who was a single mom who had dropped out of school, needed to get her high school diploma, and has done so. And now she's a technology coordinator at one of the largest adult schools in the country. And then Bridget here from Ohio, who got her CNA. All of them are exciting stories, and all of them are the sorts of stories that we uplift at our Educate and Elevate campaign. It's www.educateandelevate.org. So we have that underway. We also have state data fact sheets, which we're very excited about. Um, we have national fact sheets and then state data sheets. So if you're interested in looking at the impact um, of literacy in your state, we offer those. And what's, what we've tried to do is work with the, the best data that we could find out there. So I wanna consult with my notes here real quick because we, we use the National Reporting Service, the American Community Survey, U.S. Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the American Institutes for Research, National Center for Educational Statistics, just to name a few. So really good sources. Um, and our goal really is to sort of bring home what are the data points so that's really easy for you to be able to find those out. And so that is also on our Educate and Elevate site. And then really excited to share that we're working with the Institute for Educational Science. They produced a beautiful snapshot summary for each state that is based on PIAC data. It provides an overview of your state's literacy and numeracy standings compared to other states and drills right down to the county level. It's an excellent resource and we're happy to provide each state with a copy. We also want to invite you to a webinar that we're gonna be holding with expert presenter, Tom Krensky. That's gonna take place on the 24th that we're gonna put the chat in the chat box. Um, but this is really a wonderful resource that has just recently been provided. So if you're interested in seeing how your state ranks and the, the literacy and numeracy of your state, this is a, a wonderful resource that's free to you. So let's talk, let's kind of zoom out and talk at the, the higher level here, some education impact issues that are impacting the workforce. Um, and this specific figure is brought to you by IES, one of those partners I just mentioned a few minutes ago. 51.4 million low-skilled adults in literacy and 75.1 million low-skilled adults in numeracy. This is the most recent data that's out there. And then even kind of bigger picture, 43 million adults that lack the basic skills to compete in the workforce. This figure was provided by the American Institutes for Research based on PIAC. So huge issue right there. 30 million adults that do not have a high school diploma, yet all colleges and 63% of all US jobs require at least a high school diploma. And we also know that 20% of adults with a high school diploma have only beginning literacy skills. So they were sort of shuffled and pushed along and they have their high school diploma, but they, don't, they really don't have the skills to match that diploma. As well, looking at these big kind of overarching issues, 28 million adults in the US lack basic digital skills to operate a computer, and yet often they're operating computers. So you think about what that means for a business's bottom line, right? To have people who really probably don't have the skills 
using the computers there at the business. Or you think about what that means in terms of somebody who needs to get a job and can't even get on the computer to find a job, right? So that's another issue right there. So our programs, they really help reskill for jobs that pay a family sustaining wage. As you know, our adult learners are the first ones out of a job in a bad economy and often the last ones to get jobs when the economy picks up. And so our, our uh, literacy programs often offer workforce readiness, digital literacy, and a number of other programs as well. We serve the working poor. Approximately half of our learners are employed. How often they're often un underemployed or employed only in part-time positions. And I feel this is like a really good representation of a lot of the adults that come through our doors, right? They're working at McDonald's, they're working at Walmart, they're cobbing together jobs, trying to keep their family going. You know, the research says that, that low-skilled adults have a lot of challenges. They're more likely to, twice as likely to be unemployed, three times as likely to be in poverty, four times as likely to be in poor health, and eight times as likely to be incarcerated. We also know that in the past, before COVID hit, there were 7 million job openings in America that were left unfilled due to a lack of skilled workers. So that skilled worker issue kind of comes, bubbles to the top repeatedly. But then what are the economic impacts of literacy? So when you're able to help, help individuals become more literate, how does it impact the economy? Well, I wanna read this for you because um, this was provided by one of our uh, partnering organizations, the Barbara Bush Foundation. The Barbara Bush Foundation um, worked with John, Dr. Jonathan Roswell, the principal economist for Gallup and published a report noting that moving learners up skill levels, and we're not even talking here about getting diplomas or credentials, but rather skill levels provides this astounding impact on the national economy. I mean, we're looking at billions and billions and trillions of dollars. And again, this is if you want to go to the Barbara Bush Foundation site, you will find this report right there. And I believe Governor Jeb Bush will be doing a webinar on this as well coming up on September 9th. So just wanted to mention that. So there's definitely a great economic impact there. But then let's also talk about the billions of dollars in tax revenue. So when you look at this figure here, this is $2.5 billion in tax revenue and reduced expenses for every 400,000 adults who earn a high school diploma. That's a savings of $6,250 per person. $200 billion estimated value to our economy and reduced costs for public support programs for local literacy adult or for low literacy adults. Wow. 47% of GED recipients go on to a higher education and have a 90% rate of persistence. To me, those, those figures that have been well researched that show the return on investment are just one more reason why investing in adult education is so important. Let me just go to the next slide. And then here's the individual impact. This is coming out very shortly in a report. I was given special access to it, a report that's coming out of Portland, Oregon. 53% of those who received their high school diploma had a 53% gain in income over 10 years. I think I said that wrong the first time, so let me back up. For those who are part of this longitudinal study that took place over 10 years, they saw a 53% gain in income. And then for just 100 hours of study, there was about $10,000 increase in their income. So even if they just went to class and participated in studies, they saw an increase at the individual level of $10,000. So for someone who's the working poor, $10,000 is a lot of money, right? I mean, for all of us it is, but I think especially when you're in, and you know, just kind of cobbing together, trying to make ends meet for your, your family. But then there's this also this other piece that adult education really breaks the cycles of intergenerational poverty and illiteracy. A mother's education level is the greatest determinant factor of a child's future academic success, outweighs every other factor such as neighborhood and family income. So when a parent can read, they can teach their child to read, they can help their child with their homework. When literacy is a focus in that home by the parents, it's gonna be a focus for the uh, children. And I wanted to really make this point about, about racial equity because 74% of our adult learners are people of color, 74%. We've been doing this folks for years. We've been helping serve those at, that need our help the most. And so I'm really proud of this figure. I'm really proud that we're, we are doing this. 
here's a, a snapshot of the field. You can see we help those who have the most barriers to employment, displaced homework, homemakers, homeless and runaways, 18,000 plus, those that have aged out of foster care, 6,450, single parents, 113,580, migrant farm workers, 10,000 plus, the long-term unemployed, 65,000, English language learners, and folks, these are only, we're talking about those, these are legal immigrants who are here that we can count, 943,000 who come legally the right way, we're counting them, and these are who we're serving. Low income adults, 321,000. Ex-offenders, did you know that educate, adult education is the biggest deterrent to recidivism? We serve 92,000 through our Correctional Education Associations. Those that have exhausted TANF, 6,000, and over 63,000 with learning disabilities. These are who come through our doors every day, whether it's virtually or the brick and mortar. With all that being said, our field is severely underfunded. Our field receives on average $400 to $1,200 per pupil compared to $10,000 per pupil in elementary education. And I mean, I say that with a broken heart because I feel like this is something that needs to be fixed. Our teachers on average receive a pay cut and often work multiple jobs without benefits to work in our field. And why do they do that? Because they love that adult learner. If you could hear the, the stories of these teachers talking about why they do what they do and how valuable it is and how they see that impact it's making in that adult ed lear learner's life, this is why they're willing to take pay cuts, work multiple jobs without benefits. So here's just a you know, quick overview. We have adult ed programs in every single state. Um, these are the venues for delivery of instruction. You can see LEAs, these local education agencies are the, the largest and then the next would be community colleges. This is where you know, the venue for delivery of instruction comes in and then community-based organizations. Um, there's also faith-based organizations, libraries, universities, correctional education, and then others. And then you can see the urban, rural, and suburban distribution right there. The majority of our adult learners, as I said, they're parents, they're underemployed or unemployed, the working poor. You can see here, um, we also serve the high school dropouts and we are happy to do that. We wanna help them get their, their life back on track. We wanna help them have a future for themselves. So we are very happy to serve the high school dropouts. Um, so we serve 16 and above, all the way past 60. And, and you can see here lots and lots of folks that are of the working age, right, in, in here. Adult education provides on-ramps to better jobs and community college. Our programs serve as a talent pipeline. We reskill, we upskill, we provide literacy, numeracy, digital literacy, and high school equivalency classes. But I wanna really make the point that it's not just high school diplomas we're doing. We're also helping people move up those literacy levels, like I mentioned, that was in that report uh, by, that was published by Gallup, we're, we're not just that high school diploma. We're, we're much more than that. We're digital literacy, we're workforce literacy. And right now, I would really like to turn this over to our, our good friend, Lori Kirsten Joseph, an award-winning program there in Pima, Arizona. She's gonna talk about this slide. So I'm gonna stop, uh, turn my, my camera off and turn this over to Lori. Thank you, Sharon. Hi, everybody. Um, as Sharon said, I'm Lori Kirsted joseph I am the Acting Vice President of Adult Basic Education for College and Career. We're here at Pima Community College in Tucson, Arizona. Um, we are an adult ed uh, program funded through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So our primary goal is to help students develop the basic skills that they need to succeed in college and career. So we're working with students on their basic reading, writing, and math and English. We're working with them on their digital literacy skills and we're integrating workforce preparation skills um, and, and training in the work that we do in adult basic ed. So our programming, uh, the types of classes we have are everything from basic skills instruction, adult basic ed, to GED preparation for high school equivalency, both at our, our college locations and at the county jail. We have English language instruction for immigrants and refugees. 
we have a um, civics and citizenship preparation program, and then a, and then we have a, a big transition or um, bridge programming program where we do things like our IBEST you're going to hear about in a moment. So as you can see here, we served 4,200 students last year, and that was actually down a little bit. That includes a, a, a really quiet quarter four and bringing in students like we normally would because of the pandemic. Um, you saw some of the highlights of who our students are earlier in this presentation, but in our program last year, 67% of our learners were women, 75% were people of color. The bulk of our learners, although they all come in with a college and a career goal, come in, the bulk of them, at skills around the fifth to seventh grade level, and we work with them where they are and bring them up to transition to college and career. They are, as, as Sharon noted, working-aged adults. Um, over, just over half of them are employed um, in one way or another, part-time or full-time. 54% of our students will tell you that they are low income. That's what they reported on their paperwork. Although when we look at the income data, 71% told us they make less than $20,000 a year. Um, so that's sort of a big picture. What I'd like to do is um, we, we always like to elevate student stories. Um, this is not a picture of the real student or even her name, but I'd like to tell you about one student in one of our iBest programs and what her life looks like right now in her classes with us. Alana is a, is a single mom. She's been struggling with her attendance because uh, ever since the pandemic hit. She has two school-aged children who have been at home with her and are now learning online just as she is. Through resources that she learned about in our program, she was able to borrow a laptop um, from our college, and she was able to secure free internet for a little while early on in the pandemic. And since then, when that, that free option went away, she's been using her phone as a hotspot. She and her two children uh, have the one computer to share for all three of them to engage with learning. Um, she had a job, Alana had a job um, leading into the pandemic, but it was in catering. And so when COVID hit, she lost her work, her job. She now has found some little bit of work through a friend, but the work schedule conflicts with her school schedule. Still, she's persisting. She's trying really hard to keep up with her two classes, but you can see that for Alana, this, this, this effort to reach for something better is a real struggle for her and her, and her kiddos. Um, one of the roles that COAB played um, and plays is to reach out to the field of adult ed and find out how are things impacting the field. And so we did in COAB a survey. So let me put on my COAB board hat for a moment. Co COAB did a survey of um, more than 1,400 members to ask, how are things going in your program since COVID-19? And so we heard from programs like mine that much like my program, teachers had to make the rack rapid move from you know face-to-face -face classes to online. Um, some programs, I should say I'm lucky to be in a community college and in a program where we had a lot of support to help our teachers make that rapid transition, but the support is, that's needed is ongoing. It, it's not as simple as, boom, you're now in the virtual, good luck. We really need to keep supporting our teachers to high quality online learning um, in my program and across uh, programs across the country. We are, of course, dealing with some enrollment issues as learners are struggling with access, just like the student, Alana. Um, they may not have Wi-Fi, they may not have a laptop, um, and, and many learners, although my program is in a community college and, in it, and it's urban, as you saw from the data earlier, we also have suburban and rural programs and students who are struggling with connectivity. And then we, are, we all have our sights set on Sunday, returning to face-to-face, -face, and, and I think we all know that we'll be facing the need to find funding to buy PPE for students and staff, um, maybe um, figuring out additional space or even additional staff as we try to meet social distancing guidelines. Um, governors um, can designate funding from CARES Act um, for adult education. However, only one governor has elected to do so um, to date. While we're talking about governors and back to Arizona a little bit, I want to say that our state, um, our state association for adult ed has nominated, successfully nominated our governor, uh, Doug Ducey, to um, be a recipient of an adult education champion award. He has long been a supporter of adult ed. Every year he supports us with our adult literacy week efforts with a proclamation. And then this last year, even before the pandemic hit, knowing that there was such a need for adult ed, he contributed an additional one-time allocation of $500,000 for adult ed from WIOA monies. 
to make sure that we could get more learners into our program. And then as he made his state budget last year, he, he proposed a budget that um, was a slight increase for adult ed so that we could draw down some additional dollars that were available at the federal level but required a match. So he's been doing what he can to support adult ed and we're excited to be highlighting him as a, as a champion for adult basic ed. And then just lastly, before I hand things off to Pat, I'd like to, um, I, can't, I can't be here talking about reskilling and recovery without talking a little bit about integrated education and training models. Um, at our program, we call, we, we call that program IBEST, Integrated Basic Education and Skills Training. It's a highly successful evidence-based um, IET model. The IET model is defined in the WIOA, the WIOA law, as an integrating the basic skills component with workforce preparation and with career training all in one program. It's a collaboration between adult basic ed, our career technical ed or workforce programs at our college, and, um, and the WIOA Title I partners. We target um, IBEST programs in areas that will help learners prepare for careers and sectors that are in demand locally, so they're going to find a job, and that it starts them on a career pathway with family sustaining wages. We're really strategic to make sure that we're targeting um, careers that will really help support a family. And so our, our current programs are in automated industrial technology, logistics and supply chain management, and medical assisting, all with strong uh, employability locally in our area. IBEST programs leverage braided funding so that we can support both GED seekers and, and high school graduates who need the basic skills support um, through the whole career technical program. GED seekers are able to get financial aid just as their high school graduate counterparts using the ability to benefit provision for federal financial aid. And we also um, co-enroll all of our learners with our WIOA Title I or one-stop partners so that they can leverage those funds too to help support their work in the program. They're team taught, they're, we have wraparound support services that ensure student success. So when outcomes are, when we have a really strong developed partnership and we're not in a pandemic, <laughs> our outcomes look like 75% of our students complete the certificate in one year, the college post-secondary certificate. 75 to 80% of learners complete, uh, of completers are able to find employment in the first year after exiting the program. And then 75 to 80% of our GED seekers get the GED in that same amount of time that they get their certificate. Uh, as I get ready to hand it off to Pat, I wanna note that um, we are working to expand IBEST and, and use of ability to benefit. We're looking at ways to um, expand to, you might not be surprised to know, online learning options for IBEST. Um, because we really are seeing our learners struggle to stay engaged in the pandemic. All, you know, we all know that many CTE programs need face-to-face -face learning that, um, you know, with safety protocols can be possible, but what we've seen is learners in their lives might get exposed to um, COVID and have to take a couple of weeks to isolate and then they miss some work while balancing all of the priorities of their family and it's been really challenging. So hopefully a, more, a move to online will help a, a whole lot. Um, so I feel like that's a really good setup, Pat, for what you wanted to share next. Thank you, Lori, and um, thank you, Sharon and Amanda, for, for letting me um, say a few words to the audience today. Um, as mentioned, I'm the executive director of NASDA. We're the National Association of State Directors of Adult Education. So we, we work with, with all the states to provide support for the um, statewide administration of the adult ed program. Um, so, I have a unique perspective on adult education, having um, at one time been in a high school English teacher, but then migrated into adult education after a few years in the corporate world and, um, and um, eventually um, served as the Maryland State Director for Adult Education and then have come to this role. So um, our organization partners very closely with COABE. Um, while COABE's membership is large and includes, um, you know, both state state level associations and local providers, 
Um, NASDAQ, on the other hand, is an association of the state directors. So um, there are so many initiatives that we work together on. We, we have a single voice on. Um, we work together on collecting data and getting it into the hands of people who can make a difference for our students. So um, again, appreciate this opportunity. And I want to pick up where, where Laurie left off. Um, IET, Integrated Education and Training, um, has been the innovation of the past decade for adult education when it was realized um, in initial pilots way back early in the 2000s that um, the academic instruction and then the job training tended to occur chronologically and that's not the, not the most effective way to do it. Um, to incorporate um, the academic um, instruction with job training facilitates the job training going a lot faster where there's a particular um, job that needs, you know, mathematics reinforcement or communication, being able to, you know, write clear messages, um, to have the academic instruction coupled with the, with the occupational training accelerates both. Um, and so um, if you've ever been a student or you've ever been a teacher or you've ever been the parent of a student, you've always heard, when am I ever gonna use this? Um, so um, with, with coupling of academic and job training, um, there's no question asked about that. You know where, this, where your ability to calculate fractions are gonna help you if you're in the construction business. You know that measurement is gonna help you if, in your, if you're in healthcare. Um, so, so IET um, is, is something that you know, has been has really been um, spread through all adult ed programs and it was um, codified in the statute um, when we all were signed into law. So we've been working on this as an innovative program. Um, but when, we, when the pandemic hit, um, we not only had to pivot our academic instruction, but our adult ed programs, um, we need a partner to do the industrial training, the occupational training. And so we had um, a couple of states that were really early innovators in, um, in trying to help the adult ed programs find the partners and find the programs that could, could provide that online, virtual, or socially distanced training component for their IETs. Um, Indiana um, jumped right out to include on their, um, their required education and training providers listing, which is a requirement under the statute. So uh, they, led the, they led the charge to get their list updated. So there's a radio button where they can identify, someone looking for a training can identify what is available virtually. Um, now, all these programs that are listed here are either available virtually or if they're starting to reopen where they're in areas where they can do face-to-face, -face, um, they still have the ability to, to transition to virtual should the conditions demand it. So, um, you know, we have advanced manufacturing, industrial maintenance, CNC operations, HVAC, biomanufacturing, Child Development, Microsoft Office, Pharmacy Tech, Sterile Processing, QuickBooks, Medical and Dental Assisting, and these are just a few. And, you know, I'll, I'll add that, um, you know, while some of them, um, you know, can be done totally virtual, they've also really worked on finding for, for the components that can't be done without some face-to-face -face ways to socially distance it. So, um, so hats off to them. Virginia's been another state that was, um, you know, really an early innovator in, um, in listing out all the programs. And initially they sent me, a, a, you know, an Excel sheet with um, probably two pages of specific programs um, where an adult ed program could find a training provi provider that was capable of conducting um, the, the programming uh, virtually. So again, they have uh, identified a number of, of areas, entry-level childcare, retail, industry, um, fundamental, um, customer service and sales, Microsoft Office specialist, personal care assistant training. 
So those are just a few. Um, I think what I'd like to say um, is that we, we haven't really solved the equity problem that's been referenced earlier, where um, we have students who could benefit by these programs who just don't have access to broadband or they don't have the technology tools. Um, adult ed programs have been really um, very, very creative in purchasing hotspots and, you know, gathering up used equipment and getting them to the, to the students. But sometimes it's just really not um, at the level that we need um, in order for them to participate fully in these programs. So, so there, there remains an equity issue and, um, and we, we need to continue to work to solve that. Um, and Lori also mentioned the fact that um, governors can elect to use some of their COVID relief funding for education, for adult education, but there's only one governor who has chosen to do that. And in all of the COVID relief packages, um, there has been no specific appropriation or allocation for adult education while we've been included on a list. So we certainly hope that we can get more attention um, to the need for it for this and the fact that we believe our students will be very much a key to getting and keeping the economy back on track. So again, thanks for the opportunity to share with you today and um, I will turn it over to whoever is next. I'll take it, Pat. Thank you so much for sharing about that. And I also did want to give a nod to NASDAQ. They're a fantastic partner. We've really enjoyed working with them over the years. Um, you're probably aware that the way the funding works is that it comes from the feds down to the state directors, down to the local programs. Our organization, COE, we are not federally funded. We do not receive any of the funding. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the advocacy work that we do. And just know, we do this in the role of a friend to the field, a leader for the field. We do not receive any funding, and that's very much intentionally so. So next, I just want to talk a little bit about program challenges. The biggest challenge by far is the lack of funding. We've talked about that. But there's also a disconnect at times between Title I and Title II systems, not talking, not speaking well, and so it's hard to track. There's also at times disconnect at the local level between the workforce, um, the WIBs and the local programs disconnecting, adult education programs disconnecting. And then we've got some kind of antiquated reporting requirements from WIOA that we're, we are finding are very onerous at the local program level. So those are some challenges and I, when I was developing this slide, I was thinking, how do I show how hard it is to deal with these challenges for the local program administrators that are working with these adult learners who already have so many challenges, right? So that is why we are really excited about Adult Ed and Family Literacy Week. This is every year, the third week in September. So September 20th through the 26th, this is where we do a number of things. This year, we are having state teams that will talk with their legislators. So governors, we hope you'll be open to meeting with these state teams because they'll also, um, be, we hope they'll meet with you and their members of Congress. We wanna celebrate our successes, uplift our workforce partners and recognize excellence. We have a number of really exciting things that are taking place throughout the week. For example, on uh, September 22nd, we will be having a panel, which is going to be comprised of actually Amanda Winters here from NGA is on this panel, as well as IBM, um, one of their social uh, responsibility corporate partners. She'll be speaking as well as the Vice President for Strata Education and uh, the Executive Director for the US Chamber of, of Commerce Foundation will be on. We'll be talking about the need for workforce and education to work together. We also, uh, are every single day, are going to be celebrating successes for those who have been champions for adult education. So we've already talked a bit about Governor Ducey. Governor Wolf of Pennsylvania is the only governor we know of who's dedicated any CARES funding towards adult education. We will be thanking him for that. Mayor Turner um, of Houston, he's the only mayor that we know of that has set up a, an adult literacy um, office right there, specifically connected to his office. So we will be celebrating Mayor Turner as well. And then we also have two other legislators. So Senator Murkowski of Alaska and uh, Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio. So every day we'll have a celebration of success there 
as well as additional programming. And so here are some of our partners in addition to our 47 state partners and 36 national partners who are not listed here. Uh, our goal really is to just bring together as many organizations as possible that are working with us on this, this, this huge issue, right, of adult education needing more funding, needing more visibility, needing more resources. And these are some of the folks that have, it's actually not an inclusive list, there's more, but this, these are some of the, the organizations that have come together that will be really pushing forward Adult Ed and Family Literacy Week. We want to invite you. You're invited. We hope you'll issue a proclamation of support. We hope you'll attend the programming. It's going to, we're going to, uh, by next week, have everything up online. Um, we hope that you'll meet with the delegates from your state. We'll be taking the time to reach out to you. And we hope that if you have any questions that you'll ask them and that we can help you and that most of all, we can serve as a partner to support you when you have questions about adult education or, you know, if there's projects or initiatives that you'd like for co or our field to participate in, we hope that you'll, you'll reach out to us. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if there are any questions. Um, Sharon, this is Amanda. Um, I did see a question in the chat that came up during the presentation. So we can go ahead and start there while people are thinking about some other questions that they might have. Um, first of all, a bunch of people are very interested in getting uh, the PowerPoint presentations because Great. of all the amazing information that was shared. So all of you uh, be assured that we're going to share out all of this information and we'll be sure to connect with Sharon and the other speakers to see if there's any additional materials that could be sent out and follow up and we'll make sure that all gets to you. Um, so one of the questions was, as I scroll back up, uh, was there was a question about whether or not there has been uh, research into uh, crafting these programs with an eye towards the benefit um, that adult basic, adult basic education students will face. So Sharon, I don't know if you or one of the other speakers would like to speak about kind of understanding um, how those students are affected by the benefits clip and how that might be addressed in programmatic planning. That's a great question, and I know we've discussed this. I want to see if Pat Tyler or Lori Kirsten Joseph want to take that. I know if not, I'm happy to. So Pat or Lori, do either of you want to want to address that? I'm happy to share what. So I love the question about is there research to share and and um, and share and if that's what you're going to share, I'll be listening along with everyone else. I will say that when we are planning, especially our IET models with our um, partners, we talk frankly about what are the implications of how we're supporting our learners with an eye toward that benefits cliff, so that we are careful to make sure we aren't creating a disincentive of any kind. The other thing I was thinking about doing was putting in the chat um, a link to our Women's Foundation. Our local Women's Foundation has done some great research about self-sufficiency um, and what, what that really looks like, what the wage really needs to look like for um, families in Arizona. It's Arizona specific with an eye toward, you know, what is it really going to take to move away from the benefits and, and sustain your family? So I'm happy to put that link in the chat as well. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Lori. Pat, did you want to talk about, because I know that Reese Stagnolia, the former chair of the State Directors of Adult Education, used to talk about this quite a bit, so I don't know, Pat. Right, you know. right. So, so the benefits cliff, um, you know, what, what Reese's um, theory was that um, it would be helpful, rather than um, having someone, you know, trained and educated enough to get entry-level employment, you know, they're struggling to, um, to feed their family and, um, and support their, their housing. Um, rather than having a benefits cliff, to have a, to have a gradual lowering of benefits as someone worked. In other words, it, wouldn't, it would be sort of an, an inverse ratio. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's an important concept to consider because many times those entry level positions just simply aren't um, family self-sustaining or even for an individual to survive on, on them. Uh, so um, I think that Sharon probably has some um, comments to make too, but, but it's, um, it's an issue. It's, a, it's another one of the equity issues that, that our students face. 
right? And, and the, the answer is there's not any research yet. We know it's a big deal and we're trying to get some research done in this area. It's something that we, we talk about and think about. We would love foundations to come alongside of us and help us here because we know that this needs to be addressed. But my understanding is there, there has not been any research in this area. Great, thank you so much for addressing that. Um, and thank you, um, I wanna point everybody to the chat, Lori put the self-sufficiency standard in the chat. Um, and then also um, the slides are shared in the chat. Um, again, those will be sent up in the, sent out in the follow-up email too, but for those of you who might not be on our regular uh, email, who may have joined us today, check the chat um, for a link to those slides. Um, and then also the um, county level data, the PX scores, is also linked now in our chat. This is a very active chat. Um, so I want to make sure you all are, are all checking in for some of these resources. Um, uh, if you have a question, please throw it in the chat. I have, I have one follow-up that I'd love to ask of the presenters. Um, we have the, the groups that are brought together for this project include not only governor's folks, um, but also people from uh, community colleges and from our workforce boards and industry partners. Um, so could you all speak a little bit about how you connect to workforce partners, workforce priorities? I know di different states uh, approach oversight of ABE programs in different ways, um, but if you could speak to the workforce connection um, and uh, kind of the, the workforce with a, with a big W um, connection in states, would love to hear your perspectives on that. And I can tell you it's different state to state and it's different location to location. Um, so I'd like Lori as our administrator here to talk about how it works there for her. Sure, yeah. Um, so I am just, I'm one program. There are some like me and then as Sharon said, there'll be lots of variation. Um, so our, um, my, I'm thinking about, okay, so we're funded through, just so you know, our, our adult ed program is actually funded through the Arizona Department of Ed. There are states where the adult ed monies for WIOA Title II come through through, a, through the workforce side at the state level and somewhere they don't, like in my state. Um, we work really, really closely with our workforce partners. I sit on my local workforce development board. My state director sits on the statewide workforce board. I work hand in hand and, and partner with the workforce team within my college. So we check in regularly with the leadership and we're always connecting there. And then I will say maybe just on the ground and on the program level, we work really hard to make sure that any learner who comes through our doors is aware of the full workforce um, system and resources available to them so that they are connecting, connecting them with any and all of the resources that they might need um, to, to succeed in college and career, both with us and beyond. So we try to have that sort of no wrong door approach to the WIOA system through our program. Great, thank you. And it really is so, so Amanda, just to be really clear, it really is different state to state and, and at various locations. And that's why I just wanted you to hear you know, from Lori, uh, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer. And Pat, did you, you turned your, your video on? Did you want to say something? Well, I just wanted to echo what you say. It's, um, it's very, very different across states and, um, and then even within states. Um, and the workforce system is set up with local workforce boards and it's about relationships. Um, but to, and also to, um, to echo what Lori said, um, adult Education Title II of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act um, could be administered through a Department of Education, which I think the majority of states still, still are, um, or a Department of Labor. Um, in Maryland, I worked in both. Um, we were in a Department of Education and transferred to Labor. Um, so I think um, where, where the program sits may facilitate um, um, the interactions between, you know, the workforce system and the adult education system and really incorporating adult education into into a system. But it's all about um, it's it's really all about um, like adhering to the vision of the of the statute of the of the legislation, which really did envision um, a cohesive workforce system. We're not there everywhere. 
um, at this point, but um, you know, we continue to work toward um, the kinds of relationships where we do have a cohesive system. And Amanda, I would just tag on to what Patrick said. When I spoke at the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, earlier this year, which is hard to believe I was in person, right? We were all together in a big room, sitting side by side. Uh, I was amazed at how few of the, the workforce development boards like, knew about adult ed or was on their baseline indicators and dashboards as, as an, an important partner in looking at the outcomes. And so that was a real kind of takeaway for me that there, there definitely needs to be more work done at the local level. Um, so COAP just just ran a webinar recently, and it's really the to, for adult educators how to work better with your workforce development boards. But perhaps there's some work that we could do to help at the local level with workforce development boards. So you mentioned that there might be some folks on the phone here. So I just mentioned that as an opportunity as well because we want to collaborate. Our goal, really, at the end of the day, is that end user, the adult learner, to help them get the job or get into community college. Those are the bells we have to hit. You know, in order to be successful. So I just want to mention that as an option as well. Could I, I'm going to jump in on, on the tail end of that, Sharon, and note that um, I told you about the ways in which our adult ed system funnels students into our workforce system. I will also say that our um, we work with our WIOA partners. I mentioned in my that our IBEST programs, we identify local in-demand career pathways. I don't do that in adult ed. I work with my workforce partners. They are the ones who are closer to the employers. They are the ones who are in the, you know, have the data and can really help me see what the landscape is. And I, when I say workforce partners, for me, it does mean both my WIOA workforce development board partners and also um, my college and the workforce and CTE partners there. That's really great context. And I have to say, uh, we are not surprised at all to hear that um, these structures differ from state to state pretty much most of our policy areas you dive into, every state has to do it just a little bit different um, than everybody else uh, because, you know, because they can. Um, I know when I was based in Illinois, um, our adult basic education flows, uh, flows through our um, community college board. Mm -hmm. um, so those, those higher education connections were a little bit clearer um, just because of where uh, it was based. But an understanding of some of those structures, I think, is important for us as we contextualize how to how to help governors think about uh, prioritizing adult basic education. Um, and also, I, I would like to to say to everyone on the phone that um, that we are definitely going to follow up on on Sharon's um, offer to collaborate a little bit more on connecting to workforce partners. Um, I think we can do some learning together and uh, craft some resources or follow up. Um, for this network on on that topic because it's it's important um, and valuable, especially based on all the things we heard um, around the data and how that connects to our ongoing conversations around dislocated workers and who best needs support and how to focus support uh, in those areas. So it looks like we are um, a couple minutes before the top of the hour. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions, if you want to put them in the chat, or unmute yourself. We're certainly we certainly welcome those. And if not, I'll just share my screen one more time, if that's okay. Oh, I see there's some questions. So that's good. It's, I'll also share my screen so they can see the Adult Ed and Family Literacy Week, because um, that's that's really a big deal for our field. It's really where we're celebrating those successes and and letting legislators and the, the general public know about the value of the work that we're doing. Great. Yeah, we are getting some great input from um, uh, attendees about how what their structures look like and how they integrate um, adult basic ed, community college conversations, uh, and WIOA. Um, so that's something that we'll be capturing um, for our learning later. But yeah, Sharon, if you want to go ahead and share your screen um, to share that information, I will highlight as you're doing that um, that uh, next week for our regular biweekly conversation. We are going to have a conversation around connecting to governor's priorities um, along some of these uh, reskilling and recovery efforts. So we are excited to highlight a couple states, be able to dive in um, on how the governor's leadership, the governor's priorities uh, can connect to and accelerate um, some of the opportunities um, that are offered around reskilling and recovery right now. 
So, um, Sharon, was there any other comments you wanted to share about this or just leave the information up as we close? That in closing, I would just want to say, you know, it's really our goal, first of all, at the national level for the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, which has over 28,000 members and represents more than 65,000 in the field. Um, it's our goal really to work with as many partners as possible in a way that really is going to bring about the best results for those adult learners. Our, our programs operate on a shoestring budget and they've been doing that for many, many years. And now with the impact of COVID and the need to get all of those different things, Wi-Fi access, laptops, you know, PPE, all of that, we're in a bit of conundrum here. And um, we, we have been able to demonstrate repeatedly, the research shows that adult education is such a great return on investment. So I just would like to encourage you all to think about that. Reach out if you have any questions. We're here, we, we wanna partner with you. And your uh, state association also would love to meet with you and, and have a few minutes of your time to talk about what's taking place right there in your state. But most of all, we just we want to partner with you. And that's what I'd like to kind of leave with is that we hope that we this can be a long term relationship where we can support each other's work, support your state, and perhaps you can support us as well. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to each of our presenters for taking the time today. This is really valuable and engaging information. Uh, we're excited to share it out, um, the recording. Um, so if you have some colleagues who you think would benefit from from uh, watching the presentation, um, we will we'll make that available to you as well as all of the kind of partner resources that we captured in the chat and that were referenced within the presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. We look forward to our uh, deep dive conversation next week on governor's priorities and to continuing our work with the network. Thank you to all of us, uh, all of you for joining us today and we appreciate your time and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.